Good, good almost afternoon, I believe. No, still morning. Good morning, church. If we can slowly start to make our ways into the sanctuary so that we can count and uh, get a quorum for and begin our budgetary meeting, we will be beginning here shortly. There are agendas and uh, timeline located right in front of the sanctuary entrances. So feel free to finish up getting coffee and some drinks and we will be starting this meeting here shortly. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. We'd like to start our congregational meeting here in a few minutes. So if you would all make your way into back into the sanctuary. Please grab a, a handout of our first Plymouth journey timeline on your way in. You want one of those?
Can you, okay. Okay, can everybody please find a seat? I know the snacks are good and the conversation is even better, but let's get going so we can get back out into the afternoon. Right, Sherry Arca? Hey, should I go ahead and call the meeting? Yeah. Okay. So we will first determine that we have a quorum, which is at least 75 people in the room and online. Thank you. I believe Doug is doing the count. Hey, we have a quorum. Terrific. Thank you all for being here. I would now like to call this meeting to order here at 1135 on June 9th, 2024. And I would like to call the Reverend Bob Von Treva up for our opening prayer. Let us pray. Let him Christ, who is the head of the church in heaven and on earth. You promised that wherever two or three gathered in your name, you would be there among them. So here we are, gathered as your people. By faith, we believe that you are here also. Be with us as we carry out the business of being your church. Give us courage to speak words of truth to one another. Give us open ears and open minds so that we might hear and understand one another. Open our hearts to your gospel so that in all we do, we may not take the way of easy, the easy way of comfort and human wisdom, but the way of faith and discipleship. May all that we say and do be done in love for you and for each other. We ask all this as people who seek to follow and serve. Amen. Thank you, Bob, and thank you for that wonderful sermon today as well that kind of set the stage for where we are today, this morning. Our first um, order of business is to approve the minutes from our annual meeting that was held on September 17th, and we trust that you all have had a chance to review those minutes. So we will go ahead and ask if we are, uh, everyone is uh, all in approval of the minutes. Raise your hand. And all opposed, raise your hand. Are we good online? We're good. Okay. The minutes of the annual meeting have been approved. I would like to now invite uh, Vice Moder Eileen Robinson up to uh, give us the election of officers and chairpersons. Good morning. So is your current... Vice moderator, soon to be moderator. It is my honor to announce the roster of both council and CAM leaders. You'll find them on page four of the handout. Um, these are positions elected by the congregation, but you'll notice on page five, there's a whole lot of other names. There are many lay leaders who assume their roles through various avenues. Um, so I just wanna take a moment just to note that we enter into these roles through covenant discipleship with all of you and each other. Our congregational polity is a beautiful expression of our commitment to this church and to each other. It's both a solemn and sacred responsibility to be good stewards, both of our spiritual home and this beloved community. It requires mutual 
accountability. So we are a deeply committed, faithful group who listen for the spirit and follow where it may lead us. Now, in um, coming days, you'll get an, there's a bulletin board in the hallway that has all the council member bios. So I invite you to take some time to look at them and kind of get to know who everybody is. I'm gonna ask, beginning with council, to stand as I call your name, please. Um, so we can all get to know who's who. Okay, to begin with, um, I'm just, I, is this sound okay? I'm getting, okay. Stay close because it's very, it feels like it gets reverberating. I'm incredibly grateful to announce that the vice moderator is Rebecca Brown. So Rebecca has served on council this year and even after doing that has agreed to serve in the role of vice moderator. So it was a pleasure to get to know Rebecca this year. Uh, what's kind of interesting, she grew up in this church, right? So she has a long history. She served in many capacities. Uh, she went off to join or to college and to start her young adulthood, came back here with her husband and child to, to um, raise their family. I got to know, so she and her husband, Doug, are raising a super incredible human who I had the just beautiful experience of getting to know at Vacation Bible School when he was in kindergarten. I knew him, long, I knew them long before I knew you two. So I've known the family for some time and Rebecca runs a nonprofit and family business in one, not one, but two countries. She has just a wealth of experience. She's wise beyond her years. And so um, I think we are blessed. She brings um, her perspective, adds just incredibly to every conversation. So we are very lucky to have her. So I just wanted to share that. Okay, so for our church treasurer, Carol Westfall has graciously agreed to a, sec a, a final, a third and final two year term. So we are so lucky to have, yes, yes. So we are very, very grateful to have our continuing expertise, but that will mean we are going to be looking for a new treasurer in short time to work with her to learn the ropes. It's a big job. All right, next, the church clerk position is currently vacant. This is a two-year term. It is a non-voting role. It is critical. They take minutes at all meetings, including this one, and this creates the record of all the work we do over the years. So we are looking for somebody who is interested and can pay attention to detail. And um, so if you think that person's you, please let us know. All right. And, and very soon, <laughs> counting the minutes, the soon to be immediate past moderators, Deborah Arca. Term ending 2025 is James Bach, who, um, please stand, everyone wants to, there you go. Thank you, James. Uh, James is, again, people wear many hats in this church. James is part of the visual arts team who's responsible for the beautiful displays we see up here, as well as the art collection we see out in um, the narthex. So thank you, James, for all you do. Thank you. Steve Wilson's term is ending in 2025. Um, Steve does, serves on outreach, but he is a marketing wizard who has helped us revamp our website and gain visibility in the community. Thank you, Steve. Okay, term ending 2026, we have Gary Kriege. And Gary's um, just been so wonderful to work with this year. He is a retired minister who brings perspective both from that experience, but also as a relatively new member. He's a music enthusiast. He shares his, his trumpet playing skills with us and, and sings in the choir. And so it's been a pleasure to get to know you this year as well. Thank you, Gary. We, you, you can hold your applause. We don't, well, you, you'll, you'll give your applause by voting for everybody at the end. Um, okay, so next, uh, filling the remaining two years of Rebecca's term is Melissa Depper. 
And so Melissa's in the back. Melissa's a longtime member. She has served, again, in many roles. She's raised two incredible people here. One of them works downstairs in the Learning Center. She's been on the PPRC, the Parish and Pastor Relations Committee for many years. Um, and she treasures her spiritual home. And so we're really grateful to have your service as well. Thank you. And finally, our newest members, beginning at, uh, their term that ends in 2027 is Bruce Thumb. And I haven't seen Bruce, is he here? Oh, Bruce. I didn't see you, thank you. So Bruce, Bruce has been a longtime member, has served in the community in so many capacities with our partners, uh, board member at DICP. I mean, the list goes on and on of all the partners you've worked with. He brings a vast wealth of experience professionally and personally, and we're very grateful to have your services with us. And then finally, and I think this is the beautiful yin and yang of it all, we have Wendy Paggles, who just joined us last year. And she is the mom to two really awesome, talented um, girls. And she is a preacher's kid. So again, she brings a vast wealth of experience with lots of churches. She's super creative. She bakes really delicious goodies. And she just started her dream job at Children's Hospital. So she's on multiple new adventures. So we're really thrilled to have her perspective. So that's your council. So I thought it was important to say a little bit about who we all are. Um, okay, so CAM leaders, if you're present, please stand when I read your name. I'm not gonna give everyone's bio, but um, okay. So Christian education is Larry Strausser, and I believe he's away. He's away, yeah, okay. Uh, Community Life is co-chaired by Colleen Egan and Heidi Thomas. All right. Creation Justice is co-chaired by Jan McCoy and Pam Schmidt. Pam, thank you, Pam. The Immigration Task Force um, is co-chaired by Ann Kleinkoff, Laura Ely, and Beth Ertz, although Ann made it clear it is very much a group effort. You heard a lot about that earlier today but they're the ones who kind of take a leadership role. Outreach is chaired by Bonnie Mucklow. I know Bonnie, I saw Bonnie, there she is. Um, racial equity team is co-chaired by Sandy Clough and Patricia Springer. Thank you. And then stewardship is co-chaired by Bruce Glenn and Marie James. Okay. Oh, okay. I look forward to hearing that. And worship is uh, Jan Updake. Jan, I know I saw him. There we are. Hi, Jan. And then Web of Care is co-chaired by Ginny Blunden, Kay Grice, Tammy Weatherly, and Janet Rich. What? Tammy's going off council. Her term ended. Yes. We'll I'm sure. going off, Tammy. <laughs> she doesn't, she's leaving. Tammy Weatherly is leaving, and we'll acknowledge Tammy in a bit. Okay, so those are all of your lay leaders. And so now it is time to vote. So resolved that the above roster of officers, council members, and CAM chairs is hereby approved for the fiscal year 2024-2025. I'll turn it back to you to call for a vote. Yeah. Isn't that yours to do? <laughs> and so we will now call for a vote on the uh, election of officers and chairpersons. So all in favor of this new slate, please raise your hand. Online as well. Thank you. And any opposed? Okay, thank you. Our new leaders are officially elected. Thank you so much for coming to serve in this in these positions. Thank you. Okay, the next order of business is to get a quick stewardship update from Bruce Glenn, co-chair of the committee. Yes, well, thanks everybody. And uh 
Welcome and thank you all for the pledges, those who have pledged so far. I do want to say something about uh, being elected or whatever. I was surprised to see the evidence for 2024. 2024. Stewardship goes spans two years. And so I intend to be there until the last dot is signed and we get all the way to our full pledge goal of 660, which could be not only this summer, but past. Uh, past winter and on into the year. So, um, but as far as the future goes, I didn't want to ask me, and more importantly, no one ask Adrian. <laughs> but anyway, I'm here for, for the duration. <laughs> right. So, and, all right, now for the report. <clears throat> thank you for your pledges. And also to thank, uh, I want to thank Craig Ely for that creative uh, display that we have this year with the bricks and building the bricks. Uh, one brick at a time, and uh, it's been quite fun to, to be part of that. Um, all right, so uh, our progress report, the, our operating budget, our goal for the program, for the operating budget is, is 660000 as you know. Now, what's handed out has been updated quite a bit in the last two or three days for prices coming in. We stand at 500000 which is more than 75%. For comparison, at this time last year, we were about at that same thing because lots of people procrastinate and come in uh, during the summer. Uh, I'm hoping that that still happens and we'll be uh, uh, calling people and continuing to remind them ab about uh, about making their pledge. Um, going back to this other, last year's goal was 600,000, and by the time we got to the annual meeting in the in September, uh, it was 604,000, and then we moved up to 630,000 as people who pledgers uh, finally told us that they were going to renew it. And, we and you've heard this before. People, uh, yes, they said we're going to keep doing it, but we can't. Is that the. Is that it? Get the coach. <laughs> All right, well, I do want to say this. Um, on, on the pleasant pool, this is what I have been given to work with. And it is um, a total of 426 people who are active active members, either uh, have pledged or haven't pledged, but they're the, the, the number that I've been given to work with. And um, about 200 and, um, 177 people have pledged. Uh, on, on the list of people to pledge, uh, of which 140, 124 have pledged. Um, if I have, uh, people have pledged the same amount that they have before, 57 have pledged less, have pledged more, and uh, 19 have pledged less. And uh, we have 1,464. New dollars in, in new pledges. Uh, are there any questions? All right, that concludes my report. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yes, that's fine. Yes, thank you to Bruce Glenn and Marie James and the rest of the stewardship committee. That is a challenging committee to be on. So we're very grateful for your service. Thank you, Bruce. Okay, the next order of business is the presentation and approval of the preliminary budget and financial update for this year. We have done some really, really incredible and um, work this year to really take a deep dive into our budget, as you've already heard a bit about. So today we will just give you an update. I would invite Carol Westfall and Ken Hoagland to share this next piece of the report. So here I am in person this year. You might remember last year I missed both the June meeting and the September meeting because they both fell on milestone family birthdays. My granddaughter was 18 last year in June. She is 19 tomorrow. So I am here in person. She lives in New Zealand. So 
visiting her for a birthday is a bit of a trip, isn't it, Annie? <laughs> and my significant other turned 80 last year in September. He'll be 81 this year. So I'm here in person to deliver the message for you. It feels a little odd, actually. I have to tell you to have real people to give this message to because the last two have been to a sea of empty chairs. So I have some feedback this year. I hope it's all positive. My primary task this morning is to present for your approval a preliminary budget for the 2024-2025 fiscal year. Can you put our budget title slide up? There we go. The fiscal year begins in a few weeks on July 1st, and it ends on June 30th, 2025. And Ken Hoagland, who's chair of the trustees of the First Plymouth Fund, is here to provide some additional information about how that fund relates to and feeds into our operating budget. So first, a reminder about the budgeting process. Traditionally, it's been a bottoms up assessment of potential revenues and expected expenses. That initial assessment is processed by the trustees of the First Plymouth Fund, the Finance Committee, and Council before it comes to you, the congregation, as a preliminary budget for approval at this June meeting. And it's preliminary because the fiscal year has not yet ended. The church nevertheless needs to have an operating budget on July 1st when the new fiscal year starts. So we put this working budget in place. And over the summer, once we have end of year final figures and we have the final results of the stewardship campaign, we refine that preliminary budget and we bring it back to you, the congregation, in September for final approval. Once again, after it has been processed by the trustees of the First Point Fund, the Finance Committee, and Council. So could you put up slide two, please? You may have seen this before. You may remember this slide. You'll see it again a little bit later um, in the meeting. But last year, we made a commitment that we would stay in this building for the next three years, at least, as we determine the path forward that we want to take as a congregation, a First Plymouth Congregational Church. We had already, prior to this three-year commitment, we had already begun to take a multi-year look at our church's future finances, and it was clear that we would probably need to dip more deeply into our endowment funds represented by the First Plymouth Fund during that three-year period in order to maintain operations as, at our current level as we discern what we want to do next and where we want to be. So we estimated at that time that the first year in which we would incur substantial deficits assuming that the expense profile did not change substantially, would be fiscal year 2025, because prior year deficits had been covered by federal government grants um, related to COVID and the carryover of an unrestricted bequest that was received in 2020. And that's where we are today, budgeting for fiscal 2025, that first year in which we expected substantial deficits. And this year, because council was well aware of the magnitude of this potential deficit, we wanted a couple of top down steps to that bottoms up process that I just reminded you of. And we started several months earlier than usual. So can I have the next slide, please? So we first prepared a base case look at what the financial situation would be if everything simply continued on its current trend and we took the statutory 5% allocation from the first Plymouth Fund. The initial bottom line in that base case budget was a net loss of $345,506. 
dollars. And if you're also looking at the meeting booklet, um, that is the first periwinkle colored column on page 16 of the book. Church financial policies require a balanced budget for each fiscal year. So council and the finance committee at a budget and program summit took a close look at every individual revenue and expense component in the budget in the dual context of our purpose and vision and a desire to minimize the potential impact on the endowment in our first form of fund. So the outcome of that assessment and that work was the best case preliminary budget ratified by the trustees of the First Plymouth Fund, the Finance Committee and Council, and presented to, here today for your review and approval. This is the second periwinkle column on page 16, if you happen to have a page 16 available to look at. It shows revenues and expenses, each totaling $1,232,745. For a bottom line net of zero. I'm not showing the slide as the 2025 preliminary budget. In the course of arriving at this preliminary budget, we had two congregational conversations. And in those conversations, comments and concerns were brought up about outreach, marketing, youth future directions for the First Plymouth Fund and the Net Zero Project. And then subsequent conversations and communications from the congregation suggested some additional financial possibilities and opportunities for First Plymouth for the longer term, all of which require careful analysis and consideration but not all of which may be directly relevant to the operating budget decisions that we need to make here today. Council will be holding a series of Sunday Tuesdays over the summer. You heard that the first one will be on June 11th. And we'll take up all of these topics at a second long range financial planning summit that's planned to be held in the fall after the September annual meeting. This morning, however, we will touch on the First Plymouth Fund and will directly address the outreach, youth, and marketing questions, all of those relevant to the current fiscal year operating budget proposal. So the deep dive and the construction of the best case balanced operating budget for 2025 resulted in increased revenues of $226,870 and a decrease of 100 and thank you it's a little interesting when you go from here to here and try to focus on exactly what you're looking for my notes say 118,635 dollars decrease in expenses does that match the slide good okay can we have the next slide, please? So the base case budget would have required a draw of nearly $500,000 or 14% from the first point of fund to balance the bottom line. Remember that base case assumed that everything that just basic trend in revenues and expenses. The best case reduces that amount to a little over $281,000 or just under 90%. The best case budget, the preliminary budget that we're presenting to you here today, also increases the amount that we can take from the restricted education funds in the First Plymouth Fund. Some of the funds that can be allocated to the operating budget from the first Plymouth fund are restricted because of restrictions put on them by the donor and the education funds can be used for certain parts of our operating budget. The budget increased some of those eligible line items. So we were able to increase the amount that could come in from the education funds 
which correspondingly decreased the total amount needed from the unrestricted general fund to balance the budget. So that's how these numbers fell out. I'll summarize the other revenue increases and expenses uh, shortly. But because the bulk of the additional revenue is coming from the first print fund, I've asked Ken Hoagland to provide us with some background about the fund. Ken, you're on. You change the slide because it's still moving. Yeah, I know. Thanks, Carol. Um, we are very fortunate in this community as Bob indicated earlier in his sermon, the number of former members of this community were so committed to the community that they shared substantial resources with those of us who came after them. That is us. Over the past several years, our parents have attempted to honor the generosity of these former members and set up policies that govern the funds that they gave us. So the first thing I want to do is take a look at the policies that we have established to govern our funds. You'll do the next slide. All of these funds were consolidated into the first Plymouth Fund in, the, um, in, in 2022. You can see the purpose that have been established for the fund here. And the first thing that I want to note are the words income invested or from invested assets of the fund. This past year and this coming year, we will be using not only the income, but also some portion of the assets themselves to support the mission and ministry of this church. Second, you see the members of the Board of Trustees that has been elected by council to be the overseers of these funds. And I just want to pause for a moment and say thank you to that group of people who give their time and their energy and their thoughtfulness to helping us manage this fund. So thank you very much. Let's give these folks a hand. I'm going to go through the list. You can read it, but if you see any of them, express your thanks. Okay, would you go with the next slide, please? This slide presents the major policies behind that purpose statement that the trustees are asked to follow in overseeing the fund. The first has two parts. First, the concept of treating these assets as, quote, quasi-endowment funds, which means that only earnings should be distributed uh, for church expenses, and not the principal. And secondly, this um, policy gives council the authority to draw down a portion of the principal of the fund for church expenses. The second policy is to invest the funds in diversity of assets to minimize risk, particularly when large market swings either up or down. The question, which exactly do we have in all of these funds? If you'll put up the next slide, please. This shows exactly how much we have and here on all the fund balances over the past four quarters that's how we get reports on these funds and the thing i want to point out most importantly about this slide is you will notice as we go down the list of funds on the left hand side there's our general fund which is our most flexible fund and it represents about half of all the assets we have the other half is all restricted funds. And they are restricted with the exception of the bottom one, restricted by the people who needed the money. And so we, as the people who have 
get the responsibility to oversee and manage these funds have to respect by law those restrictions. Um, we have the brand fund, which is dedicated to um, items that are in a building, uh, the physical items of the building itself, as well as furnishings. There's a couple of building funds, and the building funds we have had for over a century, the turbine funds came to us in the 1990s, and they represent a fairly substantial portion of these assets. They're fairly restricted. Um, they were originally given to the foundation, which was the predecessor to the First Plymouth Fund. And um, the restriction in the Turpin Fund, the foundation has tried to basically, um, within the limitations of what were given in the original donor documents, that fund is flexible and possible. But right now, it can only go for. Um, people who are involved in Christian education who are under the age of 40. So, hence, we can use some of it um, for uh, Sonia, but we can't use it for, for example, Alex or Sophia. I'm sorry, Sophia. Uh, can't use it for Alex, who I think is 41. And one of the things that the um, trustees have decided to do this year is see if it's possible to find um, heirs of the original donors and look at possibly changing some of the rigidity of these um, restrictions. I don't think there's any intent to change the basic intent. I don't think we'd be allowed to do that by law. But we are looking seriously at trying to make this a bit less restrictive. Um, the other thing that I'm, I want to say um, is, well, if you go to the next slide, this is the slide that presents the various diversified funds into which the assets of the fund have been invested. And um, I will look at the, you probably asked the question, most of these are pretty self-explanatory, except for the one called TIPS, which stands for Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. And actually what these are is government bonds that adjust their principal amount uh, with inflation to provide returns that give you benefits that are, you know, that stay with inflation. So when inflation goes up, it increases the return. When inflation goes down, it uh, drops the return. And you can see that this uh, inverse, uh, this diversified portfolio is in line with what the policies of the fund are. So if you do the last slide, please. This slide presents the performance of the fund since its founding in 2020. And we will see that the dotted line above provides a base, a case which compares it to some kind of a um, benchmark. So what I mean about the benchmark is that they call it a cumulative benchmark, but it's such things as bonds get, get uh, compared to what the return is on bonds and large cap stocks get return, you know, get compared to what large cap stocks return, et cetera. And this diversification results in a somewhat low return overall in the up market and it's a somewhat higher return in a down market. When I joined the First Plymouth Fund in about 2008 or 9, we were in the middle of the Great Recession. And I saw how the diversity of the fund improved the, the situation of the fund in a down market. It didn't go down as far as the market itself. So you've got to accept the fact that the diversity helps you with swings in the market, but won't give you the maximum return in a high market, nor will it give you a maximum loss in a down market. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Carol. Maybe I'll take 30 seconds and just ask if there are any major questions. This is the way we manage the fund. There have been a lot of questions in the previous con congregational meetings about it. So hopefully this is at least helpful for that. Thank you, Ken. So to reiterate, could I have slide 11, please? 
the ultimate allocation required from the first point found unrestricted in education funds for a no, I need the next slide. There we go. The ultimate allocation required from the first fund fund unrestricted in education funds for a balanced 2025 operating budget is $337,333, which is an increase of almost $146,000 over the statutory 5% allocation. The total from the first point of fund, including those from Brown and Hebner, is $409,242, if you're counting. The detailed budget, which we'll turn to next, is on pages 16 through 23 of the book. Page 16 is the revenue and expense summary, and 17 through 23 are line item detail. I'm going to bring up some of the details that are on page 16, which are the critical numbers for us to be looking at here this morning. So if I could have the next slide, please. Wait, yeah, so we, we, uh, have a question. Go to the note, please. That we're using this year, is it uh, from the first Plymouth fund? Are we using only in interest or have we gotten into principal? So each. This coming year. That's mostly interest. Uh, the year that starts on July 1. And how much of that is principal? I can't answer that question on hand. I'd like to know the yeah. answer sometime in the future. And then the second is, can you explain the word statutory that you all? Yes, in it's, in, it's in the first point of financial policies. First point of financial policies say that 5% of um, the well quarters average balance of the first point of funds will be allocated to the operating budget. That's what she's been referring to by statutory. So the things I was referring to by statutory are this adult gives you money and they're gone. The law, not any policy that we, we put forward, but the state laws require you to honor that person's desires that they gave you in their will when they gave you the money. I've read that. I've read that in state law, Ken. I appreciate the distinction. So maybe council should consider changing the use of the word statutory in the policy. The word statutory is my personal description of what's in the financial policies. The financial policies do not actually use that word. So maybe I should change it to by policies, we allocate 5%. So that was my personal adjective. Okay, the overall revenue picture. First pledges in the best case preliminary budget, the preliminary budget that we're presenting here today, a full 50% of the revenue total, which is a major proportion of operating income, comes from pledges. And that's where you all come in. Uh, pledging has been... Um, not necessarily difficult, but an interesting personal decision for many of us over the last few years as we deal with the personal uncertainties that have been brought up by the uncertainties in the congregation and the church. This year, I will tell you, I made the decision to increase my pledge, and I did it on the basis of we as a congregation have committed to a three-year discernment period. So I personally am also committing to that same three-year discernment period. So to the extent that helps you with your own personal deliberations, I offer that here this morning. The assumption for the 2025 budget is that there will be a 10% increase in gross pledges from 2024, which would bring gross pledges in at $660,000. Our recent historic proportion of actually received 
to gross numbers of pledges made is about 93%. So that gives us $613,800 in pledge revenue in the 2025 preliminary budget. The other assumptions are Learning Center building usage fee increases from $1,000 to $2,000 per month. This reflects the year-round five-day-a-week schedule of the Learning Center. The draw from the general fund of the First Plymouth Fund, and you just heard Ken talk a lot about that, is set at $281,059. And you need to know this is a plug figure to balance the budget. So over the summer, to the extent that some of the other numbers change in either revenue or expenses, this figure might also change slightly. This is what we use to make sure we're presenting a balanced budget. The draw from the education funds, as I mentioned earlier, increases. And we are using, using $25,000 from the Hebner Outreach Fund in the first Plymouth funds. This is an amount that was ratified by the outreach CAM. They said this is part of our contribution to the overall operation of the church. It also represents um, mostly earnings in the Hebrew Fund. The base amount in the Hebrew Fund is 82000 and the balance um, as of March 30th was about 102000 So it's largely earnings in the Hebrew Fund. We're proposing to shift $5,000 from two dormant restricted funds. Arts at Plymouth and Visual Arts have not been used um, by the congregation for several years. So we're proposing, as we often do with dormant funds, we're proposing to reuse those funds. In this case, because they are donor restricted, we will use them for worship and arts department expenses, which keeps them in line with what the original donors would have had in mind when they uh, gave money to those funds. And the amount received from the learning center at the end of the year increases from $20,000 to $30,000. This could be a combination of their bottom line earnings and or money out of their investment account. Our understanding is that they have around sixty to seventy thousand dollars in the investment account. We expect about twenty thousand of this to come from their earnings at least and maybe more. So that's the um, that's the revenue look. Next slide, please. Here's a summary look at expenses, and it's important to note that all of the staff members who will be affected by these changes know about all of the proposed changes well before anybody in the congregation was told about them. Um, thus, it's a matter of ethics and good practice and concern and compassion for people involved. So none of this was a surprise for anybody. In Christian education, we're reducing the minister to families and children um, to 15 hours a week and reducing the adult education number to zero. This is another fund out of which virtual nothing has been spent for the last few years. There is a separate restricted fund for adult education that has a balance of over $4,000 in it. So there are still more than sufficient funds for our adult education program. In, we reduced the program expense from $2,500 to $1,000. Again, there's a separate restricted youth fund that has almost $4,000 in it. This fund is, re is replenished by Key Super's card sales and other youth fundraising opportunities. And the teaching pastor, Eric's hours are reduced by one third. He will continue as youth director and he will preach on a schedule to be determined with the new incoming pastor when we have one. In community life, we were able to increase the pastoral care associate, that's Sophia, to 30 hours per week because of the funds available from uh, the Turpin and Bailey education portion of the First Plymouth Fund. And the web of care, we took from $100 to zero for the web of care participant in the financial summit. Worship and Arts, um, Director of Technology. 
uh, Joel's salary and hours are reduced. And with his permission, I will tell you what he has done with um, the reduced salary. He has asked that it be reallocated to two of the line items in the worship and arts department to music and music for worship in order to sustain and bolster our music program uh, for the future health and well-being of the church. So thank you, Joel. That's a very generous move on your part. In the church council, um, our church's wider mission, we reduced that from 18,000 to 9,000. Important to note that this is not a per capita number. This is an absolute dollar figure that we as a church determine um, for the, our church's wider mission. Although the Rocky Mountain Conference does receive a portion of this to help fund their operations. The capita dues to the Rocky Mountain Conference are $15 per member, and the Metro Denver Association is a dollar and a half per member. Those are reduced in this budget to match the actual declared membership figure of the church of 531. That's the number that is in our uh, profile for hiring a new minister, and it's the number that we report to the conference. Uh, minister salary, we initially computed it at the high range that's in our profile, and we recomputed it at the mid range uh, for this budget. Convenience supplies were reduced slightly consistent with historical spending in that category. Maker faith at zero, at least for the time being. And task force expenses were reduced from $6,000 to $2,500. We don't really have task forces working at the moment. We don't know what we're going to need. So this is a bit of a, um, a guess at expenses that might supply task forces as we move forward. Business administration, we reduced marketing from 35,000 to 20,000. This allows us to sustain the website and keep it in good shape. It, we won't be able to add some additional bells and whistles like um, videos, videos for the website, but we can sustain its current good condition over time. Repairs and maintenance. Here I have sad news. We had to increase this line. I mean, we increased it to $65,000 based on the expected budget overrun in 2024 for both building and equipment and the grounds. Communications coordinator, this is Amy. Um, we have her at full time through December 31st and then 20 hours a week after December 31st. This is consistent with Amy's personal plans for retirement and it gives us six months to figure out how in the world we are going to keep doing all of the stuff that Amy does for us when she only has a half time compared to what she's doing now. Um, six months isn't long, folks, so we're gonna have to get on that one. Uh, we had a reduction in health insurance, um, office coordinator, director of administration, and facilities manager we left full time at the moment. Um, with three part-time custodial staff, they work only as needed to support church activities and external needs. You feel like you just got a drink out of a fire hydrant? Yeah, I feel like the person holding the fire hose. I hope you've had a chance to review the meeting booklet. There's additional information about operating net income and pledge history. Can I see that next? Here's the history, the orange line is operating revenue. This is revenue before money coming in from the first Plymouth Fund. This is, these are revenues that we actually receive from pledges, from building usage, and so forth, and operating expenses. I'm sorry, operating expenses are the orange line, operating revenue is the blue line. So you can see this situation has been building for some years, has been coming. 
And then also, if I could have the next slide. Also in your meeting book is this 10-year look at capital maintenance and expenses. They are not affected by the operating budget decision that we are making here this morning, but it's important that you know what the capital maintenance requirements may be over the next 10 years. This is based on our estimate of how long things are going to last. If they last longer, we won't have the expense until later. But by the same token, if they break sooner, like the water pipe out from a couple of weeks ago, we have the expense sooner. It's also important to note that if we were not in this building, we would still have some capital maintenance and expense hours that we were looking at. I would guess probably not this much because the building wouldn't be as old and um, have as many things that are reaching the end of their life. But this doesn't completely go away um, if, if we go away from this building. So it's important to know that as well. And I also should mention that um, the roof and parking lot here, which are often um, part of a net zero conversation, the roof and parking lot total here is about $765,000 out of the $3 million. So there's a fair amount that is not roof and parking lot. Uh, HVAC is about another $735,000. Even with a net zero system, you still need an HVAC system for the net zero electricity to run. Maybe less, we don't know. Ca uh, council will be taking all of this up over the summer and at the financial, financial summit in September. But I just wanted you to know that it's not being ignored. All right. I'm about to make my final statement. You're going, Whew. I am. In summary, council is presenting to the congregation for approval a preliminary operating budget for the 2025 fiscal year of $1,232,472 in both revenues and expenses for a balanced bottom line. With that, I move the adoption of this preliminary 2025 fiscal year budget. Thank you, Carol. Sure. I want to respond to the question you asked, Beth. Your question, if I understood it, was how much more what sort of what portion of what we're taken out of the fund comes from earnings and what portion comes out of principal? The reason we don't know the exact answer to that question right now is because we're not at the end of the fiscal year. And so we don't know exactly what all of our expenses are going to be. Likewise, we don't know exactly what our earnings are going to be on the fund. However, one of the things that I do in my role as the chair of the trustees is try to monitor the market, the bigger capital market that we have all our money invested in. And I just looked at my projections that I've done uh, to help Carol and the finance committee come up with the details for the budget. And I just calculated that if the market continues the way it has been for the last year, we probably will be going into our principal during the coming year, the coming year of somewhere between 150 and 175,000, provided we have as good earnings in the coming year as we have had in the past year. And then I'll give you the. Uh, that all of a financial advisor will tell you, and that is past performance does, does not guarantee future performance. So with that, I just wanted to respond. I, I guess I was just, I can, I, I thought we had discussed that we were earning about 12% on the fund this year. And so that what we were then 
taking out to balance the budget was not actually uh, even 12%. So I didn't think we were dipping into the uh, principal this year. I thought that's what we had determined. Is that not correct? Yes. So we. And do you mind using the microphone? Okay. Okay. We did earn 12% this year. Uh, but 12% won't in the coming year won't cover everything we're asking for out of the fund in the coming year because it's larger than what we are asking for this year. Okay. There, I, yes. I think there is a little bit of um there's a there's a little bit of yeah. I'm not super clear on that. So why don't we uh, within our financial summit this fall, we can revisit that um, because that's not what I was understanding the last time we talked about the budget. Rebecca. Do you mind use? Yeah. There may have been a slide that was skipped. Yeah. Numbers and it got skipped. And so it had good information on it. If we could go back to that slide and check that out, I think that would be a good idea. Yeah, this slide has what the market value is at the during the past three months and what it has been over the past year. You can see the withdrawals that have happened as well as the earnings. Um, and we basically have a, an end market value of 5,041,000, which is all of the funds, restricted and unrestricted. We overall earned 12% and we had the blended benchmark. Remember I was talking about the blended benchmark usually is a, in an up market is a little bit higher. So if we had had everything invested, for example, in the S&P 500, we'd probably have earned 20%, <laughs> but we don't. Um, that's why we have the diversified investments that we have but that gives you an example of both what we've withdrawn and how much we've earned that it was that was good for this past year we're asking to take out more in the coming year and that's not, the reason not we're, no we're not in the 2025 budget the dollar amount is higher Uh, Carol, is that correct? The dollar amount we're taking out for the. Okay. Uh, yes. Carol, if you don't mind as well. Okay. Um, the percentage has come from different funds, so it's a little hard. Yes. Um, the, um, the, the final percentage from. From the general fund is almost twelve percent, and then there's a yes. lower percent from another fund. Correct. Also, the the reason this is a difficult question to answer is when we calculate the percentages, we don't calculate it on that number. We calculate it, remember, on the average of the previous twelve quarterly balances. We're not putting 12% in every one of the previous 12 quarters. So we're pulling some money from um, principal because we haven't been earning 12% for, for three years. And that's why this question is hard to answer because of the way we, the way we look back to calculate the percentages that we're pulling out. Also, when we we haven't pulled the money yet. So, and we will pull it if we need it. So we don't know until we go forward into the next year exactly what's going to come out. We'll make our best, right. take our best shot right. at it. Right. We okay. have a motion yeah. on the floor. We have a motion on the floor. Um, well, I need, we needed to clarify what was being presented. And so that was well, usually the discussion comes after the motion is okay. acknowledged. So, so we are now into the discussion period after the motion. Um, the motion is to approve the preliminary budget. We don't need a second if it's coming. I, okay. I don't think we need a second if it's coming from council, but that's fine. Okay. 
Hi. We have a second. Hi. We'll go Beth and then we'll go Jerry if you want to come. Thank up. you for recognizing me. <laughs> I've been absent from the church for about four months. I fell. I had a shoulder replacement. That was all fine. It's gone well. I'm still recovering, but my br husband's brother uh, died on April 15th after being on a ventilator for 15 days. Um, and recently, that you don't know, Wyatt, my grandson, broke his leg. So we have a lot going on in our family. I've not been able to keep up with what's happening at First Plymouth. And it's dear to my heart. Most of you know that. I left council after I fell. I had too much on my plate. And as you can see, I'm very committed to an immigration task force and to the creation justice ministry at the church. But I did make some written remarks that I've already shared with Deborah this morning that are about what we talked about, are talking about right now. I had clear, I had uh, in detail reviewed the annual report. I've read it about three times. Deborah and Carol know that's kind of normal for me. Um, I don't love numbers, but I've had a great deal of experience with them in my life because of my career. I think you've done a great job. I love all of you who serve on council. You know that. And I think that you've had a really tough year, maybe one of the toughest years that this church has ever gone through. And I applaud you. Now my watch is ringing. Now I, I applaud you for what you've done. And I hope you get the support of the congregation in everything that you're looking for. But I have a few thoughts. Sorry. Having reviewed the uh, budget and looking, Carol Hainsey provided me again with financial policies just a few days ago. I've also read every one of those again. Um, and I'd like to suggest that there's policy that's already written for the church and for council that we're not following. One is that the First Plymouth Fund is supposed to report off on a regular basis to church council. In my years on church council, that never happened. Um, and I think we could have had these conversations like we're having now. I would have understood the thought about principal versus interest. And Deborah, you would have too. How much of the principal are we using to fund this year from the fund? The second is that the Learning Center is supposed to be doing the same thing. And that has not happened either. And the Learning Center financials to me as a council member were fuzzy. I never quite understood them. And they appeared in several different places. They're not their one own 501c3 or separate entity. They're just all rolled in over the year into the church. Um, and so it's hard to separate them out. I think Carol Hainsey and Carol Westfall know them clearly. I'm not suggesting that there's anything funny going on. I just think that we need to follow policy. If we don't think that's the right thing to do, then we should change it. Um, but it's really important that we have infrastructure based on what we're going through right now and that it can hold us up as we move into our future. Um, I, I don't know what our future looks like. I appreciate Bob's comments this morning about how we should be looking to our vision and purpose, of which I'm greatly involved in in the church. They're important to me. The Immigration Task Force and Creation Justice Ministry, net zero. I feel this church is a place of abundance. Not only is it you that provide abundance, but it's our financial situation that offers abundance. I've said this many times at council, and Ken and Carol, it looks like we have more money in the fund now than we had last year. We had four, four million something. Today we were reporting five million something. So last year we were so big, but hallelujah, we made a little bit of money on interest. It's wonderful. You've done a great job on investment. It's helping us. We have such a place, sorry, my backs are to you. We have such a place of abundance here to remember that we use that to lead this church. Thank you. And I won't say another thing, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beth. Thank you for your comments. I think Jerry Arga had. Oh, wait. And I'm, only, I'm only moving us because no, I know, but I'm not done. I'm so sorry. My one last point is reviewing the staffing reductions that we made. 
I wasn't surprised that we made them. It's a very sad day in mm -hmm. First Plymouth that we had to do this. I think we made some wrong decisions. They're in my notes. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to, if you want them, you can have them, but you may agree with me or have others. But I think that we missed an opportunity to keep the spirit alive here by reducing Eric's hours. And um, that we could have made other changes. And I hope that on these three ideas, the first Plymouth Fun Board reporting to council, the Learning Center reporting to council, the changes in the reductions of staff be readdressed before September. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Beth Ertz. I just have a couple questions on the chart uh, on the screen. And the right-hand column, it says uh, the investment earnings were $612,000 and withdrawals were $366,000. Why would we have to dip into principal if we're that much? Hey. That, was last year. that was last year. That was April through March 24. Okay. So that was showing what we did so last going year. Going forward, it's going to be radically different, you're saying. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. And then Betty and then Jeanette. Sorry. Um, so as I understand, this is kind of a question, but as I understand it, we got, we figured out a way to get more money for uh, Sophia and we were able to raise her hours. Is that correct? Correct. So that's a win-win. Yes. Equal, equal. Everything mm -hmm. stays the same, right? So why then did we take money out of the, out of what we were giving from our general fund? for the budget because we were taking more out of that. That's what I think I understand. There is there is nothing coming out. In other words, that money that we're giving from that fund, yeah, that's a wash, but it isn't a wash when it comes to how much we're taking out of the funds because we're not taking that amount out of the funds in another area like we were. Is that correct? The amount that we were able to use from the education funds, which are restricted, reduced the amount that we needed from the unrestricted general fund to get us a bottom zero figure. So it's that simple. Well, it's not really simple because there's no reason to reduce what we were going to use of that other fund. If we did not reduce the amount coming out of the unrestricted general fund, the bottom line uh, budget number here would be a positive figure, exactly what, maybe $60,000 or $70,000. If we have that kind of surplus at the end of the year, it goes into our operating uh, reserve, but our capital reserve. It doesn't allow us anything to have a positive bottom line by taking money out of the unrestricted general fund. That's, a, that's the basic oh. math. So it was just to balance the budget. Yes. But so there should be that amount, though, that we could use out of the general fund for. Well, if we use that amount, because it's not in the budget. Now, if we use that amount out of the general fund, we are exceeding the amount that say that's in our financial policies by even more to have to if we can use the education funds. It just reduces the percentage of the way that we can do those. Thank you. Thank you. That's I don't good. agree with the way okay. it's being done. That's all I can say. Okay. Noted. Jeanette Henderson. Well, I have two things. One, my concern, and I understand you're going to have more meetings, but one, my concern about Eric, 
-hmm. And I understand he won't be working at all during the summer with youth. And that is a big concern. I hate to just throw our youth away. And so that bothers me. And the other is on the task forces. We had task forces and they ended. And I see that there's still a budget in there. Mm -hmm. If we're going to have task forces, do we not hear from them mm -hmm. and get reports from them? Correct. Because we didn't from either one. Thank yes. You. Yeah, we actually we actually did have uh, reports out from the task forces at CE. So the relocation task forces made a presentation and the worship and wellness being task forces. Correct. Not the very final final. The very final report that came to council was like a 50 page report that we were presented that very night to review. So council needed time to review that and digest that before we were felt ready to be able to share that with the congregation. I would just say, yeah, just a, a, a remark on Eric's. Um, so, you know, we are not the size of a congregation we were five years ago, and we still have we still have the same staff, the size that we had five years ago, or we did before the budget. We can't continue to keep all of our staff and all of our programs running if we don't have the pledges coming. So that's just a very basic thing. We can't keep all of our staff if we're not meeting our pledging goals for the year. So we just have to understand that as a, as a congregation. We're a smaller congregation. We have quite a big staff. Congregations our size don't have the staff we have. So just know that that's part of what has to happen for the future. And nobody wants to cut Eric. Eric's one of our favorite, you know, we love Eric. However, he 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 was not, uh, was not here all summer anyway. Like usually there was a month that he was away on sabbatical in the summer. So it's not like the youth are getting their whole summer taken away. And let's get some volunteers and let's do sweep the summer without Eric. I mean, there's a lot of us that could do things with the youth in the summer when he's not here. So we have to get creative at this time with our resources. Um, any other discussion about the budget before we vote to approve the preliminary budget? Okay, I do want just the people that I want the people that were on the financial summit that was council and the finance team. I want everybody that was involved in the financial summit to please stand so we can recognize you and thank you for the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a lot of hard work and Carol Westfall uh, created an incredible process for us to go through to get that done. So um, we are getting to the end here. And, oh no, we need to we need to vote. Okay, so let's vote. All right, um, all in favor of the preliminary budget that was presented today, please raise your hands. We go back there. Online. Okay, we're just waiting for the online. <laughs> Come on, you people online. We good? Okay, anybody opposed? Two here. Uh, Betty, okay, three. Oh, sorry, I didn't need to say your name. Okay, so keep your hands up if you're opposed. We have to count you. I'm seeing four. Okay. Okay, so the budget passes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, so um, we don't have any new business. I just wanted to uh, direct your attention to this timeline that council created to help us all understand where we are in this journey we've been on since Jimmy arrived in October of 2019. And I'm not gonna go through it all. I was gonna kind of walk us through it, but I don't want to given the time. I just want you to look at it. And I want you to know, know that everything on this timeline 
has been giving us information for taking the next step. Nothing has been wasted. Nothing uh, is not being used. Every piece of information from the amazing work that the Faithful Futures Task Force did starting in October 2021 uh, there is something missing in here, too. I would say January 2022, there was a lot of work around converting the foundation and the endowments into the first Plymouth Fund, which was for the sole purpose of supporting the ministry and operations of the church. Okay. So then we had forums. We had uh, we had the, the sudden resignation of Jenny, which threw everybody for uh, a loop and caused a lot of uh, grief and sadness. Um, which I believe we're still kind of working through even today. Uh, we had a, um, so the Faithful Futures Congregation Forums, what that told us as council is that we were not all on the same page. Some people were way ahead of others and we needed to slow down and then catch everybody up. So we began uh, a discerning in purpose, vision purpose. Um, you can read a little bit about that there. At the same time, there was a very passionate group of people that had a vision for something we might do here in the church called a kind of a wellness and worship center. Those folks came to council and asked if they could apply for a Lilly grant for a million dollars, a million two. Uh, we approved that. They went ahead and applied for that. Um, at the same time, we were having congregational listening sessions because we were noticing that Folks were feeling there was a rising sense of division, that there were people on sides, and we really wanted to bring people together to listen at a heart level to what was happening. In the fall of 2023, we realized that uh, we were not at a consensus yet. There were still a lot of, as, as Bob mentioned, we were not united in the way we wanted to move forward. So we asked, uh, we presented the three-year vision, which said we were going to stay in this building and can, can continue our discernment process um, for the next three years. And that is what we are doing. Um, uh, we've been through, we're almost through it. So we're about eight months through that process. And um, we uh, had to take a pause on the task force work this spring after one task force dissolved and another task force was coming to the close of their phase one and we weren't sure what council wasn't quite sure what phase if how we were feeling about moving into phase two yet so we took a pause while we needed to address some priorities which were getting a new minister on board a stewardship campaign and the um was the third thing the budget. Oh my goodness, this budget we've been talking about all day. Okay, so um, they, so and then at this and in, and in that time period, a net zero task force came to council, which was fantastic. We have yet to present that. That is part of something we need to present out to you as well. So all of this is to say, there's a, it's council's work now to compile all of this information from the past several years into some document that we can used to move us forward to make the decisions that we're heading toward, toward in that three-year vision, which is another couple of years. We felt very strongly that we want to wait until we have a new pastor with us to help guide us through this process. We are a church. So a minister is here. We're paying the minister to be our spiritual guide and our leader. So that person hopefully will be coming this fall. And we will be regrouping and probably forming some new work group task force to develop a, the kind of phase two, the next process that will take us kind of over the finish line. So there's still a lot of work to do, but look at how much work we've already done. What I wanted to do is invite everyone that's been involved with any piece that's on this timeline to stand up. Okay. Just so we can see all of the people that have been working so hard on all of these task forces for us. And I wanted to just uh, acknowledge them and thank them with a pause. Okay. Okay. So, so here we are. Uh, and um, I wanted to just highlight that this summer we are doing a series of Sun Tuesdays. We do know that people are a little weary and they're tired of 
arguing about um, our potential future. So this summer, we want to open it up and have some creative and just light times of ga dinner gatherings where you can come and talk about what makes you tingle, as Bob said. So join us for those dinners. Uh, bring your own dinner and then bring your dessert to share. Well, have some, you have some fun exercises to take you through that will to create the best possible to the story for First Plymouth. Uh, those will be six, uh, six to eight, six to eight on Tuesdays, and the dates are in the emails and monthly newsletter. So, okay, and all I would say is, you know, no more, no more, no more us versus them. It's all of us. This is us. That's the prayer and the hope that we move forward together. So uh, I know some of us are weary. Some of us are frustrated, sad. Take a break if you need to. It's okay to take a break. But don't give up because I believe 100% that we're going to move forward with God's help and find our beautiful future. So don't give up and keep believing. All right, I'm going to pass the gavel over. <laughs> Thank you, Heidi. And as I prepare to pass the gavel today, uh, I just want to offer a few thanks. I'd like to thank everyone on council this year for your extraordinary commitment to the church. Thank you for showing up again and again with big hearts, thoughtful questions, creative ideas, and boundless energy. It's been an honor and a deep joy to serve with all of you. Thanks especially to those who are leaving council this year. Colleen Egan, our tireless clerk, who was a wise conversation partner and took meticulous notes as she is still doing through some very long meetings. <laughs> Thank you to Tammy Weatherly, who was an invaluable conversation partner, partner to me personally these past few years and was a strong and clear thinker on council and the task force. For Beth Ertz, a passionate and faithful voice who reminded us to always lead with our purpose and vision and stay transparent in the work. Thank you, Beth. And for Craig Ely, who stepped in uh, in these last few months to finish up Beth's term with uh, his grace, humor, and thoughtfulness. Thank you, Craig Ely. I want to thank Carol Hansey and the office staff for their uh, going above and beyond, literally, <laughs> or Carol. Can't take a vacation around here, apparently, um, for going above and beyond this year. And thank you for all you've done to support council and our work and my work. Oh. Thank you, Carol Hansey. Finally, thank you, especially to my vice moderator, Eileen Robinson, for accepting this position last year, knowing that it wasn't going to be easy. Thank you for being a true partner in this work for me. Your calm, your calm and steady presence has been a gift to all of us, and your careful attention to mission team and our governing policy has been critical. You reignited my energy when it was flagging, and you helped me to take a deep breath when I was anxious. So as I turn this gavel, I need to find <laughs> And this is not my dog that made these chew marks on this gavel. I don't know. It was passed to me this way. Anyway, as I turn this gavel over to you at this time and with your amazing vice moderator um, by your side, I do so with great confidence and gratitude for your strong leadership faithful presence, and your deep love of this community. We are in very good hands. Thank you. Well, and I have to say that um, just to thank our immediate past moderator, uh, I am just in awe of you, really. I, yes. Thank you. Yes. 
I, I had a front row seat. It was um, trial by fire for sure. Carol mentioned drinking from a fire hose. Being vice moderator last year was that. And you just included me in every possible way. And your grace shines through every day. And uh, you are just a dynamo. She's just so quick to respond. She kept all the balls in the air. There's a lot of them. I was shocked to learn how many you're juggling. <laughs> There's a lot. So thank you. And we do have a gift for you to express our gratitude. We got you your very own Tibetan singing bowl so that the sound may wash over you and resonate help you relax, lift the weight. This year has been a weight, and now you get to let go. And so we're hoping the singing bowl, yes, we'll, we'll do that for you. So thank you so much. So. Now it's my turn to learn to breathe. So I, I accept this most humbly. This is a huge honor. Um, you have been such a huge part of my family's life for 18 years. My husband, Sam, and I, we've raised our two boys here. You've watched them grow. You've shaped them. I mean, Betty, you and Jerry welcomed them with open arms when they were itty bitty. And we just hold such a special place in our heart for you and Nancy Joe and all the beautiful people here who who welcomed our family through the messiness. My boys were a handful and you and you loved us. <laughs> Janet Rich is nodding. <laughs> you loved us through the messiness. Okay. So I've I've loved this community. I've served in so many capacities, never imagined this one. So, but in a moment, this is what we all do, right? You rise to the moment. And so what's interesting, just sort of coincidentally, so um, our youngest, Zach, is 20. He goes to school and lives in Montana. He called us just the other night. He had been in Glacier National Park and was just exhilarated. I got to put that down because so, I'm playing with him. So, and he just said, though, he's elated. He, he loves Montana. He goes, but it doesn't quite feel like home. And then he says, and you know what? I'm not so sure Denver feels like home anymore either, right? These are his growing pains as he discovers who he is and what he's about, what's important to him, right? Um, you know, as Bob said earlier, right, we've experienced our growing pains in many different ways over the years. So, um, as Zach's trying to figure out what home means, we are too, right? And so the concept of home, it's profound. Um, it transcends the physical space. I think we're all in agreement on that, right? We can, we can appreciate sacred spaces, but our relationship transcends that. Um, so we, it's just woven, our community, we're woven together. It's the fabric of our experiences and our connections, the memories that we cherish. So this church has become a cornerstone of what home means to me, my family, the sense of belonging, that support through transitions, right? And we do that for each other. So as we navigate our path ahead, we're going to discover what home means for us. We're gonna to weave together the new and the familiar uh, with the unfamiliar in the past and the future. We're gonna put that all together. But really what's important is we're gonna do it together. We're gonna to take it one step at a time. As our church's story continues to evolve with God's grace, right? We'll find home with each other in our shared journey ahead. So I thank you for this honor, and I thank you for being here. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Bob for our benediction.
Yeah, we can leave the video. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Can you turn on my um, upset light? Not a commission here for a while. All right. Thanks. Um, actually, I, uh, this isn't technically on the agenda, but I, I had suggested I think it's important at this time to um, do an installation of our officers who have been elected today. So I'm going to invite all who have been uh, elected uh, today to various positions, council and so on and so forth, to come up here. Um, I think the ones, not the ones going off, but if you're still, if you're still on for another, another year, sure. Come on up. I don't like, it sounds like maybe there hasn't been a tradition of doing this in our church, but I think this is important for all of us to express our thanks and support to these folks. So these people have been called by God in accordance with the faith and order of this church to serve among us. I'm getting touched by this argument. Um, they have accepted their call and are here before us in witness of their willingness to serve. And so um, question for them. Um, sisters and brothers in Christ, it is an honor to be entrusted with responsibility for particular service in the ministry of the church, whether gathered or scattered. So having prayerfully considered the duties and responsibilities of your ministry, are you prepared to serve with the help of God in Christ's name and for the glory of God? If so, please say, I am. And do you promise to exercise your ministry diligently and faithfully? showing forth the love of Christ. If so, please say, I do rely on God's grace. And um, members of the congregation, you have heard the promises of our brothers and sisters in Christ who have answered God's call to serve. So let us affirm our intention to live in covenant with them. Will those who are able please rise and witness to the commitment that we are making? And I'm going to Give you it. I didn't have this printed out ahead of time, but I'll give it to you a little line at a time here. We gather in celebration of the joy that is ours. Yeah. To be partners with you in the service of Jesus Christ. To be partners with you. We promise to love you. Honor your leadership. And assist you that together we may be a faithful church of Jesus Christ. That together we may be a faithful church of Jesus Christ. And I invite you to, in the congregation, to stretch out your hands towards these folks as we pray a, pray a blessing on them. So let us pray. Eternal God, you have called these people to serve you in this household of faith and in the world, which you have entrusted to our care and keeping. Send your Holy Spirit on these, that they may be may serve among us with honor and faithfulness. Help them to be diligent in their duties, that your church may prosper in the mission you place before it. May their example prove worthy for all of us to follow, as we are united in Christ's ministry to the glory of your name. And let us all together say, Amen. And so I, uh, in the name of Jesus Christ and on behalf of the people of First Plymouth Congregational United Church of Christ, I announce that you are installed in your respective positions. Thank you. And, uh, and let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this time together, for we thank you for the history of this church, all the folks who have brought us to this time and place, for your sustaining care through all those years, ups and downs, for the people who have served and now get the chance to take a break, for the people who have now stepped into these positions, and may we all seek together how best that we can live out being a church, uh, a great church, and living Christ's mission. So bless our time as we go from here and in the days to come. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.